The Mark. 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 Meaning and transformation. En arkei en hol logos, kai hol logos, en proston theon, kai theos, en hol logos. At the beginning of time, meaning already was, and Elohim had meaning with him, and Elohim was meaning, an interpretation of John 1.1. 1, 1. What happens when a man finds no meaning in anything he has, and at the same time has no feeling of Elohim? Meaninglessness is a terrible illness. It has to be got over. It's the same as godlessness. Because if you say there is no God, because if you say there is no Elohim, you are saying that there is no meaning in things. But if you think there is meaning, you believe in Elohim. Meaning is Elohim. You can't say that you do not believe in Elohim, but believe that there is meaning in things. For the two are the same, in that one cannot be without the other. Elohim is meaning. God is meaning. If you dislike the word God or Elohim, then say meaning instead. With the word, Elohim shuts some people's minds, but the word meaning cannot. It opens the mind. Meaning was before time began. It was before creation. For creation occurs in running time, in which birth and death exist. Birth and death belong to the passage of time. But meaning was before time, and creation in time began. There is no way of describing existence in the higher dimensional world outside time, save by the language of passing time, of past, present, and future. Meaning is, not was, before the beginning of creation in time. It does not belong to what is becoming and passing away, but to what is above time. If then there is meaning above our heads, what is our meaning by creation? The universe is not merely what the senses show. It's not the outer scene alone. In fact, it's never the outer scene alone, but always the combination of oneself with it. It's not merely the perceptions of the senses, this hard world of earth, that outer point of light in the sky but perceptions of ideas, insights into truth, realizations of meaning, the seeing of familiar things in a new light, intuition of essences, experiences of suffering and of bliss. It is given as bread from heaven as much as fact from earth. On its grandest scale, it lies beyond all command of the senses and is only discerned inwardly in the understanding. There can suddenly be opened within the heart or in the mind a realm of experience that is not the external world, though it may interpenetrate it, and we are then bathed in the light of meaning. In that light without violence, which is pure experience, luminosity without shadow, in which the hardness of self vanishes. We see with the authority that meaning gives us. We touch without the sense of separateness and externality that all physical touch inevitably gives us. We feel in depth without talking to ourselves, without the mirror of surface personality. Every experience of that light deeply creates us. It is creating light, transforming meaning, which all have sought since the beginning of time. Light that can do no violence to anyone, meaning that shows us what we have always known and never had the strength to remember. Not only do we feel ourselves created by every experience of that light, but this, we say, is what we are always looking for. This meaning, this reality, this bliss that we have misinterpreted and sought in a thousand useless physical directions. This 
is what we all desire, which the outer light of life pretends to offer but never properly gives. This union, which we perceive really is union, the secret idea behind our odd, searching, incomplete lives. How is this light obtained? How can we obtain this union with meaning? Through what does it shine? Where must the knife enter to open a way for it? It has always been spoken about. A man must begin to dissect himself away from himself to find it. This, in brief, is the substance of all teachings concerning it. And this he cannot do unless he begins to see himself directly as a new conscious experience, a new event, the daily event of himself, not analytically, not critically, nor as a source for talkativeness. This kind of consciousness, whose direction leads toward the region through which meaning is received, is not what we ordinarily have. Very much stands in our way. First in strength, is imagination. We imagine we have it. The imagination is a psychic material out of which every substance for reality can be made, the most powerful force in life. And second, we have to put into constant practice this process of using consciousness as a dissecting knife. This requires effort that is not needed in life. So we easily forget and fail to keep alive what we began. But before any such thing is conceivable, man must feel that there is an internal side of the universe drawn in through the inner senses, that he lives outwardly in nothing but a world of effects whose hidden causes lead into the mysteries beyond all human solution, and that in himself there are states unknown to him. For if a man is sense-governed, he's the wrong way around. He thinks sense prior to mind. Nothing internal can then belong to him. He has inverted the natural order. He will deal with everything, ultimately, by violence. For the sensory object, taken as ultimate and highest reality, can be smashed, injured, blown up, or killed. That is why materialism is so dangerous psychologically, spiritually. It not only closes the mind and its possible ingiven development, but turns everything the wrong way round, so much so that man seriously explains the house by its bricks, or the universe by its atoms, and is content with explanations extraordinarily poor of this quality. The object of every church has always been the salvation of man, and in himself man is the church, communicating with what is above and what is below, having an outer and an inner side. The great cathedrals are nothing but half-beautiful, unfinished representations of a man. But consider the knowledge that constructed them in those dark, violent, superstitious times. Consider the terrific labors and the steady intention. Something has always been kept alive and handed on from generation to generation, from church to church, from religion to religion, an idea about man, about each man, about oneself. This idea was expressed by likening a man to a seed, which could not grow through the light of the natural world, that is, by sense alone. And the salvation of man, which has always been insisted upon as necessary for the health of the whole world, meant the growth of this seed, which cannot grow through the influences of ideas that belong to a mind wholly commanded by the senses. So we come back to the danger of materialism in regard to the real welfare of humanity. If there is a higher part to man, he is not lifted to it by the ideas and customs belonging to the lower part. He must first of all accept the existence of a higher side, and then find how to imitate it. And this being so, you will expect to find, scattered about the records of history, a literature that deals with the ways and means of attaining this higher side. And of course, the ideas in this literature will not be of a similar order to the ideas that belong to the lower physical side.
Nothing is true until it's assimilated. Truth can only be your experience of it, not in books. There's a process of half thinking and half imagining, which is very intimate. It's partly conversation with oneself, partly being oneself, partly seeing oneself, and partly listening to oneself to new meanings that are entering. It is half active, half passive, and something that is purely oneself, neither active nor passive. We rarely can pursue our own thoughts. <laughs> the traffic in the mind prevents us. We do not individually join one thing with another or see the truth of something for ourselves. The rush of associations, the continual reactions to life are too powerful. Few of us will say we have built much inside. We have not recreated, re-represented the world but left it in the form of a confused sensory image. If we notice ourselves when reading, three people are concerned. Concerned. There's the reader, the person inside listening to him, and a judge. These three people are all present when we read. This listener can't hear what outside people say. He listens to the reader and notices what the judge says. In order to recreate the world, that is, to create the world in oneself, to give it meaning, form, interpretation, order, significance, it is the listener who must learn. One takes one's ideas, one's thoughts, one's feelings, and one's power of imagination and works internally with them, realizing that no matter what other people know or have said or have written or done, nothing has as yet happened in oneself of any value. There has been no personal assimilation of truth, no inner discovery of it, no creation in oneself. If our emotional life were more aware Awake. Then the union of thought and emotion would feed this deepest and most real part of us, and we would feel the happiness that comes from the mingling of meaning with life. And our behavior would be different, because everything would present itself to us with infinitely more differences than is possible as long as we receive everything in a habitual way. Life fails to nourish us because we view it habitually, through a few habits of the mind. We recognize and do little else. We call this knowing, or even truth. There's no doubt that we have, and sometimes realize, powers of reception very much finer than those we employ. And if we seek to define what development can mean, we can say that it consists in the far more conscious reception of daily life through the use of these powers, a far finer perception whose direction is toward both the inner and the outer. That would mean having continually to stand aside through a continual recognition of them from habits of mind and feeling to dissect ourselves from ourselves. As it is, we allow our lives to become a monotonous repetition, not seeing the cause in ourselves, but in our circumstances. Consciousness is unshareable. Our consciousness, your consciousness, is your own. Mine is mine. Since consciousness is unshareable, the whole direction of one's life should be towards experiencing everything for oneself, to be conscious to oneself of oneself, to see for oneself, and to be able to do for oneself. Only in this way is anything created in oneself, and once created, it's one's own and is permanent and is real. So everything is fresh, everything is new, everything is untouched and unspoiled by previous explorers. Everything is at a certain stage in thought, feeling, in understanding, in experiencing. It's impossible for growth in meaning to borrow truth. To be told dogmatically what is true is to accept mass truth. It can only be an experience according to one stage. No one can taste an apple for you. A description of how it tastes that's useless. Just in the same way, in everything that really matters, no one can really help you. Only your own power of seeing the truth of anything can help you. And it's exactly this power 
which we seek to throw away in the hope of finding something easier. In every situation and problem, if we could go deep enough into ourselves, away from habitual reaction, we would know what to do, because we would light upon new meaning and see the situation transform. The End of Part 4 the mark, 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 mark,